rebuke. The word rebuke, as it appears in the Old Testament, is normally translated from the Hebrew word yaka. Uh, it is a prime root that means to be right. Uh, that is to say, to be correct. It's also been translated in the King James Version Bible as to argue, uh, to chasten, to convince, uh, to plead, or even to reason. You know, there are different degrees or levels of rebuke. Uh, the uh, first one we're going to look at today is just a, uh, just a friendly uh, reproof, a gentle reproof, if you will. For example, if you had a friend who was having financial difficulties, it just seemed like they couldn't keep the holes out of their bucket. It just uh, money comes in and money goes out. And you know, what you might do is gently uh, advise them that you know, maybe you should look at what God's instructions say about being prosperous. Don't get involved in usury. Live within your means. When you buy something, save up for it and pay cash. Don't, don't buy things on credit. You end up paying two or three times the original purchase price when you charge things on a credit card. The second level might be something like when you admonish your brothers and sisters concerning the Antichrist. You tell them, you know, the Antichrist comes before the second advent and then admonish them, encourage them to get into God's word so that they won't be deceived. And of course, the strongest form of rebuke would be, for example, in Matthew chapter four, when Christ rebuked Satan and showed us how to handle Satan. We're gonna take a look at that today as well. You know, God encourages, encourages us in his word to correct our brothers. Now that doesn't make us a judge or a jury. That's not what rebuking is all about. Rebuking is gently guiding people in God's word. Let's take a look at where God instructs us to rebuke our brothers as we begin our lecture today. Leviticus uh, chapter 19. We're going to just do one verse there. Leviticus 19. And we're going to do verse 17. <clears throat> the law given to Moses. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. And this word brother is uh, awk in the widest sense. In other words, it's not talking about a brother of the womb. And you know, to not hate your brother, what in the New Testament, in the epistles of John, the first epistle of John, Chapter 3, verse 15, if you hate your brother, that throws you in the same category as a murderer there in the first epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 15. You, find, you can find no salvation in the flesh if you hate your brother. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. And what this means is that if you see a neighbor, a friend doing something and you don't correct them, you know what they're doing is wrong, they're liable to bring sin upon themselves. And as a result, you end up feeling guilt as a result of it. You have to be careful of who you rebuke and when you rebuke. You know, if you rebuke a wise person, they'll thank you for it. But a fool, will probably mock you or insult you, might even curse you when you try and correct them. Turn with me over to the Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs written just after the book of Psalms. You'll find the Proverbs written by one of the wisest of all, Solomon. And the Proverbs are comparisons, if you will. Let's pick it up with chapter 9, verse 1. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn down her seven pillars, seven being spiritual completeness. But wisdom has, has built a mansion, in other words. She, referring to wisdom, hath killed her beast. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished 
her table. She's, she's prepared a fantastic feast, a feast of wisdom and understanding to those who are intelligent enough to uh, uh, take her counsel, her advice. She hath sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. This is wisdom. She's, she's calling out to, to those who are not so wise to take her counsel. Whoso is simple, who, who, whoever is uh, seducible, we could say, who, who could be seduced by the Antichrist, let him turn in hither with wisdom, in other words. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Moffat translate the last part of this verse as she calls him who is uh, devoid of sense. Verse 5, what does wisdom say? Wisdom says, come, eat my bread and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Come and partake of this feast that I've prepared for you. You who lack wisdom. And yet note that wisdom is inviting those who are not so wise to come. And you know, we could, we'd be intelligent to take a lesson from wisdom in that. If you're going to correct a brother, it would be received much better than for you just to say, well, by the way, Bob, I've noted that you're really messing up here lately and I'm going to help you out. Don't do it that way. It's not going to be received. Wait for, or better yet, invite the person. Offer the person. You know, I've been noticing you've been having some trouble with da 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 da, -da whatever here lately. Would you like for me to share with you what God's Word says about that? And that helps the person. That, that lets them know that you care about them, that, that you want them to do better. And that's what wisdom wants us all to do better. Verse 6, forsake the foolish. Wisdom continues to those who aren't so intelligent. Forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. And of course, if you're a Christian, your way is Jesus Christ. Verse 8, excuse me, 7. He that reproveth a scorner, a scorner you could think of as a mocker, uh, someone who could care less about God, in other words, getteth to himself shame. In other words, if you try and reprove or correct someone who is worthless and, and godless, you're probably going to get insults or mocked or cursed yourself. And he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. He'll mock you as well. This kind of falls under the category of don't cast your pearls before swine. You know, our job is to plant seeds with people. But if you try and plant a seed with someone and they laugh at you basically and you know from their character that they're godless, that they could care less about anybody other than themselves. Don't waste your precious seed on them. That's what casting your pearls before swine means, is don't waste your time. Kick the dust off your feet and move on to trying to help someone who wants to be helped. Verse 8, reprove. This is our word, yaka, also translated rebuke from the Hebrew not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke, yaka again in the Hebrew, a wise man, and he will love thee. A wise person will accept the counsel, the reproof, the correction, and thank you for it. Whereas a wicked man, a worthless man, will probably insult you, could care less. Verse 9, Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man or a good man, and he will increase in learning. He'll even learn more. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Why do we correct people from, reprove people from? 
the Word of God. That's what's right. That's what's correct. That's the right way to live. And you help people when you share God's Word with them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You're, you're all familiar with Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, which states the fear of the Lord or the reverence of, of all of the reverence, the beginning of all knowledge is the reverence of the Lord. But that verse ends, fools despise instruction. You can't help a fool. Verse 11, for by me, wisdom speaking, thy days shall be multiplied and thy years, uh, the years of thy life shall be increased. Turn on over to chapter 13 with me. We're going to spend a little time in Proverbs this morning. Proverbs chapter 13, I'm going to go with verse 1. A wise or a sensible son heareth, heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. A scoffer or a mocker can't be helped. Don't, don't waste your time even trying. Yeah, plant the seed once to see if they can be helped, but once you realize that they're a scoffer, and don't care, don't waste your time. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Verse 2. A man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the transgressors shall, be, shall eat violence. Moffat translate this last part of this verse, come to an untimely end. Verse 3. He that keepeth, keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. It will ruin him. <coughs> Excuse me. And you know, there's a time to talk and there's a time to listen. And it's hard to learn something if your mouth is open. So uh, if someone who just talks continuously, uh, some people have a problem. They want you to know or think how intelligent they are so they spend a lot of time telling you how intelligent they are. That, I guess they don't think you're intelligent enough to determine that after they talk a little bit. They have to talk a lot and, and tell you how intelligent they are. Verse 4. The soul of the sluggard, or, and that's a lazy person, desireth or, or always wants <clears throat> and hath nothing. And that's, that's the rewards and the reward of laziness is you have nothing, absolutely nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. In other words, those who will work will have enough, will have abundance, in fact. Why? Because if you work, that's pleasing to God, and you receive his rewards and blessings. Not so with a lazy person. God doesn't think much of lazy people, and he makes that very clear in other places in this very book. Verse four, 5, a righteous man hateth lying or deception, but a wicked man loath is loathsome and cometh to shame. This word loathsome is baosh in the Hebrew. It means to smell bad or uh, figuratively to be offensive morally. But uh, they're always ashamed, in other words. Verse 6, Righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner. Wickedness takes a sinner off the way, the path. And of course, that is uh, a Christian, their way is Jesus Christ. Verse 7, there is that maketh himself rich. In other words, there are those who pretend to be rich, yet hath nothing. They pretend to be rich, but they're actually poor. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. There are those who pretend to be poor, but they actually have plenty. I couldn't help but think about uh, Sam Walton when I thought about this verse. You know, he didn't have any, any heirs about him. He drove the same old Ford pickup for years. I've personally witnessed him flying into an airport. And does he rent a car or call a taxi? No, 
He gets a hold of a grease monkey and says, hey, you, I need to go to the nearest Walmart. Can you got a car? Yeah, well, let's go. And he expected him just to take him on over to Walmart. And he did most of the time, uh, just the way it is. But he, he pretended to be poor. He didn't dress up fancy, but probably one of the wealthiest men in the world. He built an empire, but uh, he didn't have any heirs about him. Verse 8, the ransom or the redemption price of a man's life are his riches. In other words, a rich man has the necessary funds to buy himself in the flesh out of bondage. This is not talking about eternal life. You can't buy eternal life. But the poor here is not rebuke. The poor won't listen to correction. Verse 9, the light of the righteous rejoiceth, or, or is, is awesome. The light of, of a righteous person shines. When, when they walk into a room, people know a Christian has walked into the room. And of course, the light that's in us isn't our own light. It's Jesus Christ. He's the light. But the lamp of the wicked shall be put out, blotted out in the lake of fire. Verse 10, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. In other words, those who are all caught up in self-pride, that, that causes problems. It causes contention. But a person who will accept counsel and correction is wise. Wise people take on no heirs and they're willing to accept uh, correction. There's one that you want to rebuke in the strongest form. That, of course, is Satan. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4 in the New Testament as we continue our study on rebuke. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4, of course, this is where Jesus shows us how to handle Satan. We all need to learn from, from this scripture. Verse 1, chapter 4, Matthew. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit. Uh, which Spirit are we talking about? Note the capital S. We're talking about God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, of course. Into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, 40 in biblical numerics, probation, Christ passed. He was afterward and hungered. Physically, he was starving to death. You would be after 40 days. The flesh weakened, but his spirit is strong. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, in other words, prove you are the Son of God, Command that these stones be made bread. Now, what do you, we note about this? What was Jesus' physical state? He was hungry. He'd been 40 days and 40 nights without food. Satan realized his weakness at that moment. And you know what? Satan knows your weaknesses as well. He'll attack those weaknesses, if you allow him to. Verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Christ quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3 here. What Jesus is saying, you know, physical bread won't save you. The bread that you obtain in the Word of God will save you, will bring eternal life if you follow. Verse 5, Then the devil, the tempter, taketh him up into the holy city, Jerusalem, of course, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, in other words, prove you're the Son of God, Cast thyself down. Jump from this 20-story building. For it is written. And who's speaking here? Satan is quoting scripture. He's going to twist it though. Watch. 
He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. Satan left out the part to keep thee in all thy ways. Again, Christ is our way. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time, he added, at any time, thou, thou dash thy foot against a stone. Satan's saying, trust in God. And God said in the book of Psalms, he's quoting Psalms or kind of quoting Psalm 91, uh, verse 11. God said that if you jump off of this 20-story building, that his angels are going to come and catch you and save you. You don't tempt God with nonsense like that. And Jesus knew it. He corrected him. But don't, if, if you go jumping off of a building and expect God to send angels to catch you, the law of gravity is going to prevail. Verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16 is where that, where that instruction, that command is given. You know, that generation that perished in the wilderness, they tempted God some ten times. It's written in Numbers chapter 14, verse 22. Don't tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 8, again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Satan certainly doesn't give up easily, does he? Verse 9, And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. You know what? That's what Satan is going to want you to do when he returns in his role as Antichrist. Worship me. And he'll promise you anything that you want, if you will worship him. Don't. Uh, that is the purpose of the elect, you, God's election. You're not going to worship him. You're going to follow Christ's example. Verse 10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 13. And this is the same as saying, get behind me, Satan. And you know, in Luke chapter 10 verses 17 and 18, Jesus gave us power over all of our enemies, including Jesus Christ. So when Satan comes up to you, you can do the same thing that Jesus did. Or you can allow him to beat you up continuously over and over and over again. We say, get behind me, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ. Always remember that last part. You have to use, the power isn't yours. It's not mine. The power is that of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. Verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Don't entertain Satan. Don't argue with Satan. Rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. There was one instance where Peter rebuked Christ. And Christ, in turn, turned around and rebuked Peter. Turn over to Mark chapter 8 with me. Mark chapter 8, let's pick it up with verse 27. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? Jesus is saying, you, You've heard the chatter. What, what are people saying about me? Who, who do they, people think that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. Some people think you're John the Baptist. But some say Elias, the Greek equivalent of Elijah. 
and others one of the prophets. The multitudes aren't really sure just who you are, Jesus. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Note he changed the question. And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. That's Christos in the Greek. The anointed one. You are the Messiah. And he charged, he forbade them that they should tell no man of him. It wasn't time yet. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man, speaking of himself, Son of Man, a phrase that means Jesus while he was here on earth in the flesh, must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. It was written and after three days rise again. And Jesus willingly paid that awesome price for you and for me. And he spake that saying openly. In other words, he was saying all this in very frankly with his disciples. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. And this word means to forbid. He's saying, no, Christ, don't, don't die on the cross and resurrect in three days, which would have defeated death. And Peter's saying, don't do that. Peter's thinking in the flesh. Peter's saying, Lord, we're not going to let that happen. We'll save you. You see, it wasn't the disciples who were going to save Jesus. Jesus was going to save us. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest, or you're concerned, not with things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Jesus rebuked Peter because Peter was thinking flesh. He wasn't thinking spiritually. Let's turn to Paul's final instructions to Timothy, and I'll add his final instructions to us as they're written in the Word of God. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy. If you get to Hebrews, you've gone too far. Make a U-turn and go back. 2 Thessalonians. Excuse me, Second Timothy. I'm going to get confused myself here, giving you instructions on where to turn. We're looking for Second Timothy chapter four, verse one. Paul's final instructions and exhortation to Timothy and us. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, at the beginning of the second advent. Preach the word, preach God's word. Be instant in season and out of season. Be, be ready at all times. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. What do we rebuke with? What do we correct others with? Doctrine, the Word of God, the doctrine of Jesus Christ. For the time will come <clears throat> when they will not endure sound doctrine. People, there's going to be a time coming, Paul says, that people won't put up with sound doctrine, but alter their own lust, or I should say, but after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. This means that they have teachers that they want to say comfortable things to them. Tell us all we have to do is believe. Don't, don't rebuke us or admonish us or reprove us or correct us according to the word of God. Just say things that, that, that 
tickle our ears. That's what that word itching ears means. That, that the words are so uh, sweet that they tickle our ears. Sound like today a little bit. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. How many churches today, instead of teaching straight up the Word of God, teach their kids that Eve took a bite out of an apple in the Garden of Eden, and that's where all the problems... You know, that probably has kids afraid to eat apples. Think about it. If you tell the kid that's what caused all that problem, they're probably not going to be too quick to eat apples. But they've turned away from truth and are listening to fables, fiction, fairy tales. But watch, be watchmen, thou in all things, endure afflictions, that's adversity, do the work of an evangelist, plant seeds, make full proof of thy ministry, study uh, to show thyself approved a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul's ministry on earth in the flesh was coming to a conclusion. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul didn't waver. You know, we, we are to follow the example of Jesus Christ, but I would also encourage you to follow the example that Paul set for us. What a servant. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And Paul earned it. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Are you ready for the second advent? Man, I'll tell you what, we've got an election coming up. And I don't think either one of whoever wins that election is going to be able to straighten out our mess. There's only one that can straighten out our mess. It's Jesus Christ. I say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. And he wants him to come shortly to him because several that were with him had turned to the ways of the world. And he gives the last few instructions. In closing, though, I want to, you to know that if Jesus loves you, he will rebuke you. He will correct you. Turn over in closing with me to Revelation chapter 3. As you know, Revelation chapter 2 and 3 is where Jesus addresses the seven churches. We're going to pick it up with the final, the seventh of the seven churches, that being the Laodiceans. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, and it reads, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen. Amen means truth the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. In one place in Revelation, he would say, I'm an Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The first letter, Alpha of the Greek alphabet, Omega, the last. Verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither, neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. Have you ever known anyone who rides the middle of the fence on every issue? They, they can't make a stand definitely this way or definitely that way. They have to be somewhere right in the gray area, not the black or the white. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will or I'm about to spew thee out of my mouth. Do something, make a stand for something, even if it's wrong is what Jesus is saying. Verse 17, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, that's the things of the world, and have need of nothing, not, not even God, 
and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You think you're covered, but you're not, is what Jesus is saying. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Open your spiritual eyes to where you see truth. Have righteous acts that are, make up your long white robe. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. So that you're not naked. Verse 19 to close. As many as I love, I rebuke <clears throat> excuse me, and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be Zealous means to be anxious for the Lord, anxiously awaiting his return. But when you have brothers and sisters who are going about life wrong, don't hesitate to offer help to them. And by that I mean rebuke them, but do it gently, do it intelligently, do it with the word of God. Uh, be careful not to judge. There is a difference between judging and, and reproving someone. But uh, if they're intelligent, they'll thank you for helping them. If they're a fool, they'll probably curse you. But only let that happen once and then uh, move on to another brother or sister. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word, Father. Your written word that so easily tells us of the events of this time, Father. It is truly the way that Paul said, Father, that people won't listen to truth. They want to listen to fairy tales, Father. They want, they, they want not for a man or a woman of God to correct them. They want them to say something that tickles their ears. Father, we thank you for the truth. We thank you for your written word. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. You to develop your relationship, how do you do that? You talk to him. Uh, uh, to seek his counsel when you have major decisions in your life. <clears throat> Thank him for the many blessings that he bestows upon you. If you think he's not blessing you at all, you're probably taking your blessings for granted. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask you to look on these. You know their needs, uh, uh, addictions to drugs, alcohol, Father, uh, illness in families, Father. You know if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. And we lift up our, our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, direct, protect, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks around the country. Uh, first up today, we have Jerry in Minnesota. Where in the Bible is the verse about evil will be good and bad will be evil? I think you meant evil will be good and good will be evil. Uh, Malachi chapter 2, verse 17 gets it said, said, You have wearied the Lord with your words. When you say, every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. And you know, that's what 
turning things upside down means to me, is saying what is evil is good and what's good is evil. And it appears to me that our society today has a way of turning things upside down. Uh, when we legalize same-sex marriage in the United States, that's turning things upside down. That's making something that God considers to be abominable, making it okay, making it good and righteous. Uh, God doesn't think so, but uh, man seems to. Debbie in Canada, will a gay person go to heaven? Being gay, as I just said, is an abomination to the Lord. It is not the unforgivable sin. Ed in Arizona, did the people created on the sixth day or Adam and Eve have belly buttons? I don't think they did since they weren't born of a woman. Well, God created them and if he wanted them to have a belly button, he certainly had the capability of doing that. But uh, that's not the first time that that question has come up. Uh, obviously, if God created them, they weren't born of woman. So uh, the navel, the belly button, which of course is where the umbilical cord is connected to the mother, uh, is not necessary if there isn't a mother because as you say, Adam and Eve had no mother and they had a father, don't get me wrong, but they weren't born of the flesh. They were created. Brian in West Virginia, in the 19th chapter of Revelation, during the marriage supper of the Lamb, is that when we all will be changed and New Jerusalem be established? And is everyone changed at one time or is it that those who believe are changed first. Well, the change you're talking about is when Jesus Christ returns at the seventh trump. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, and the following verses. It states there in the, the twinkling of an eye. And now, the marriage feast follows uh, the return of Christ. Uh, he defeats his enemies but his election who uh, don't uh, bow a knee to the Antichrist, don't worship the Antichrist, are his bride. And that you were pointing out correctly in Revelation chapter 19. Uh, Michael from Oklahoma. I have a, I can't read that right. Where in the Bible does it talk about the three world ages? Thank you and God bless you and your staff. And thanks for remembering our staff. We have a very hard working group of employees and volunteers. They accomplish a tremendous amount of work and uh, we're, we're so very thankful for them. The three, three world ages, uh, uh, something that if you don't understand you're never going to understand the mysteries of God. The mysteries of God's Word will always be a mystery to you until you come to understand the three world ages. Uh, many places in the Bible refer to the three world ages. Uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 3 in the New Testament talks about the world that was. Um, you know, that's a very important subject. As I said, if you don't understand that, there's no way you're going to understand God's Word in its entirety. Uh, we, on page three of every monthly newsletter, there's a list of suggested studies for new students, both in CD format or cassette tape. So if you're interested in the three world ages, I highly recommend a study by Pastor Arnold Murray entitled Three World Ages. It's CD number 30506. Very important that you get a handle on that one. Rebecca, and I don't know where Rebecca's from. Could you tell me what Bible verse it talks about gray hair? Okay, well, uh, one, I think there are two locations that the word hoary, H-O-A-R-Y, is utilized. And that's an old English word that means gray-headed. <coughs> Proverbs Chapter 16, verse 31, it states, 
the hoary head or the gray head or hair is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. Rosa in Kentucky, does it say anything in the Bible about the eye? I also, oh, and also, does it say anything about we will look 33 years old when we pass away? Well, let me take your last question first. Uh, every place in the Bible that an angel appears, <coughs> they're, <coughs> excuse me, they're des described as a young man. And uh, how old was Jesus when he was crucified? Approximately 32, 33 years old. So uh, that's where that uh, comes from. But, uh, you know, age to a spiritual body is irrelevant. Uh, uh, the spiritual body does not age, it does not get sick, uh, and that's the reason we can look forward to taking on that body. These flesh bodies, they get old, they get sick, and fortunately when we die, the flesh returns to the earth, the spirit returns to our Father. And the eye, the, I think one of my favorite places in a reference to an eye is in Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 32, verse 10, where God is speaking of Jacob, which is uh, symbolically all 12 tribes of Israel. And it states there that God kept Jacob as the apple of his eye. Uh, the apple of his eye is the pupil of his eye. And in other words, when someone messes with one of God's children, it's like sticking their finger in God's eye. Uh, not a way to, not the way to get good things going for you. Also in an eye, we have an eye for an eye in Matthew chapter 5 verse 38. Linda in Alabama, can you repeat your sin, repent I guess, can you repent your sins of divorce and still go to heaven? Well, divorce is not the unforgivable sin. You know, many churches uh, try to penalize uh, those who have been divorced and, and basically make them second-class uh, Christians in their church. Uh, if you've been divorced, you can't be a Sunday school teacher. If you've been divorced, you can't be a deacon. Uh, if you've been divorced, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, you know, there are justifiable legal what reasons for divorce. You didn't know that? Well, you haven't read Deuteronomy chapter 24. Uh, then you ask, you follow with a second question, what is the unforgivable sin? And again, it's not divorce. The unforgivable sin is for one of God's election to refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through them when they're delivered up before the Antichrist. Uh, 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 Luke chapter 12, uh, start with verse 10 and go through about Luke uh, verse 13. Uh, the elect are not to premeditate what they're going to say. Uh, why? Because it's not them who are going to speak. It's the Holy Spirit uh, who will speak and even the gainsayers will be convinced. Mary in Michigan, would you please explain Revelation chapter 13, verse 18 for me? Thank you very much. May God bless you all. And he does, and God bless you as well. <clears throat> and uh, Revelation 13, 18 states, Let him with understanding count the number of the beast. It's the number of a man. And who is the beast? The beast, of course, is Antichrist. And the number of man is 666, it states there in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. Uh, the Antichrist comes in the sixth trump, uh, the sixth vial, and, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the sixth seal. Robert in California, why do the pastors believe the King James Version is the best translation? And would you please consider doing a detailed study on this subject and presenting it to the congregation. Okay, well, the reason we uh, suggest and encourage people to use the King James Version Bible is that it's the Bible that's tied to the Strong's Concordance. 
It's very important for people to be able to take God's Word, the letter that He wrote to you, back to the original language. Uh, the translators uh, from Hebrew to English, from Chaldee to English in the Old Testament, uh, the translators from Greek to English in the New Testament did a pretty fair job, but they did they could have made some better choices in many cases as far as their selection of words. And you add a lot of meaning to your studies if you're able to take God's Word back to the original language. A good example, Luke uh, chapter 14. Jesus states there that you have to hate your mother and your father if you're going to be a disciple of His. Uh, Moses taught us that you honor your mother and father. In fact is, uh, I pointed out in our lecture that Jesus endorsed Moses as the writer of the book of Leviticus because later on in the book of Leviticus we're going to see that the penalty for cursing your mother and your father is death. Uh, and that goes into not taking care of your mother and father as well. But if you have a strong concordance, I about got off my point there, is if you take that word hate and look it up in your Strong's Concordance, you'll find that it means to love less. Now there's a big difference between you have to hate your mother and father to be Jesus' disciple and loving them less than Jesus to be His disciple. Margaret in California, please give me an example of a righteous act. Well, and what does righteous mean? Righteous means doing what is right. Uh, visiting someone who is sick uh, would be a righteous act. Uh, helping an elderly person do something that they're no longer physically able to do would be considered a righteous act. Uh, planting a seed of truth with one of our brothers and sisters uh, who are lost in this world of darkness is a righteous act as well. And you know, God keeps very good records. Uh, he doesn't just keep a list of everything that you do bad in the book. He keeps a list of everything that you do that's good as well. And you see, there's a judgment day coming. It's called the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20. Uh, it's not only going to be punishment for the wicked, it's going to be rewards for those who have a lot of righteous acts uh, next to their name in the book. Bill in Kentucky, can you explain how some people got the rapture theory from the Bible? If there is no mention of the rapture in our Bible, where does this come from? I understand it came about in the 1830s but I don't understand what chapter and verse in the Bible they think it comes from. That everyone at our church for their hard work, oh, thank everyone at your church for their hard work in bringing us the real truth about God's Word. And thanks again for remembering our hardworking staff. Rapturists, of course, point to 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 4, verses 16 and 18. And you know, we're not flying anywhere. Jesus is coming here, Acts chapter 1. Uh, after He ascended to heaven, after uh, the 50 days Pentecost, uh, the, the two angels were there and they said, what are you guys standing around looking at? Uh, don't you know He's going to come back to the same point? He even tells us where Jesus is coming back. That's to the Mount of Olives. Uh, we're to have the gospel armor in place, Ephesians chapter 6. Why? So we can stand against the fiery darts of Satan. You don't need the gospel armor on if you're going to fly away and be gone while the Antichrist, Satan, is here on earth. <clears throat> you mentioned 1830. Uh, we offer two books uh, by one author, Dave McPherson. Uh, the first is called The Incredible Cover-Up. Uh, and has a suggested donation of $10. The Rapture Plot is by the same author and is 15. You don't need to order both books because everything that's contained in the 
first book I mentioned, The Incredible Cover-Up, you find in the Rapture Plot plus more. So don't order both of them, just order the Rapture Plot if you want the whole uh, bowl of bananas. If you don't want the whole bowl of bananas, uh, just order Incredible Cover-Up. William in Louisiana, if I eat a little bit of sausage, could God hold that against me? Well, as we learned in our last lecture, swine's flesh is unclean, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 7. Uh, eating swine is a violation of health laws. That is a sin against the flesh, not your, your, your soul. And try some uh, turkey uh, sausage or bacon if you miss uh, pork bacon uh, and see. You'll find it has a lot less fat and tastes uh, remarkably close. I've been told, and I've never eaten pork myself, uh, the bacon. Cheryl in Texas, I have a question concerning praying to Archangel Michael to pray for us and the state of affairs in the present time. I am not sure if this should be done as I believe and have heard you say many times that we are to pray only to God through Jesus Christ only. Well, we're not to worship angels. In Revelation chapter 22, verses 8 and 9, uh, John uh, fell down and started to worship the angel that had shown him. And the angel said, See thou do it not. I am your fellow servant. Angels are fellow servants. I'm out of time. I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. It makes Father's Day when he sees you studying the letter he wrote to you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and reach out to others as well. There's one thing that's most important, though, and it's this. You stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.